All right, good afternoon. My name is Dean Starovosnik, and I appreciate you entrusting me with your post-lunch nap. Um, <laughs> yeah, actually, my primary measure of success is the number of seats that are filled at the end of the talk. So actually, if you go to sleep, that's a good thing. Um, increases the odds you'll be here when I'm finished. But no, seriously, um, my role is to help our clients design buildings. And because we normally design for the future rather than for the past, uh, oftentimes we're struck with the difficulty in determining how do we design for five years from now when things are, are so crazy. And so my objective today is rather than to give you a bunch of techniques and tr tricks and so forth, is more around getting you to think maybe a little differently about your current state, your historical state, and then about your future state ultimately. And we're going to take some lessons from my experience aboard the Battleship Missouri. I was an officer in the Navy for about 10 years and had the privilege of bringing Missouri back into commission in the um, late 80s, early 90s. And so we'll look at how we can learn from what was then a 50-year-old battleship and used quite effectively uh, when it wasn't designed for any of the things we did with it during uh, Gulf War I. So with that, uh, we'll go ahead and jump into this. Um, I'm partly sitting down because I'd rather this be a conversation than me like preaching. So um, if you have questions or scenarios in your world you'd like to you know, engage the group with, certainly encourage that. Uh, if you have questions that come along, um, please don't hesitate to you know, put your hand up. I can stop the tape and we can interject and then we can get back to the, the planned program. But um, I say the more involvement, again, the greater likelihood you'll be here at the end of the talk. So. All right, with that, um, we're going to talk first about some principles, some basic ideas that uh, are applicable to a lot of things, not just facility design. And then we'll move into some specific practices that are focused on designing facilities. And, and to make sure that we're clear on the boundaries here, we're focused really inside the box. We're going to be talking about how big to make the box, but we're, we are focused inside the box. This is not a discussion about networks and how many DCs to have, although we can certainly see how some of these factors would play into those things. That's kind of outside the realm of what we'll be talking about, but if you want to chat about those kind of things afterwards, certainly have my opinions on that as well. Um, and then, like I say, the discussion's at the bottom, but I really kind of imagine that sort of peanut butter spread across. So if you have things, again, you want to talk about, let's do that. So let's first uh, move on to discussion of the principles. A move on to a discussion, there we go. Um, and we'll be talking about the idea of possible versus probable. See, today's ships are built and designed for what's probable. Back in the day, these ships were built for what was possible. Uh, Missouri was designed during the late 30s, and her keel was laid in 1941, uh, shortly before Pearl Harbor. So this was a ship designed to go into battle before World War II actually started. Um, and so even then, they have to be designing forward. Uh, again, they weren't thinking about designing for 1991 when she was brought into play in Gulf War I, but that was the sort of thinking that went into her original development. In the case of what was possible, there were a couple of Japanese battleships that were on the ways at the time, on the ways meaning under construction, that had 18-inch guns. And so she was built to defend against and survive those kind of shots, um, what was possible. Certainly all the smaller ships were not a threat if they could handle the larger ships and what they could do. In order to do that, she had to deal with this. This is the Japanese uh, battleship class, the, say the Yamato. Um, they never actually ran into each other. There was never this conflict. Um, she was, in fact, the Yamato was taken out with aircraft for the most part, and, um, and not with the battleship guns that Missouri had. But we'll see how their design, the design that went into Missouri, uh, teaches us some lessons about design of facilities. In order to withstand the kind of shells that the, uh, the Japanese battleships as well as the German battleships could throw out, Missouri employed a number of techniques to address the potential damage. One of those was the use of armor. Um, in this case, there's actually two different elements to the armor. One is that which is to address shells that are falling from above, because most shells being ballistic are entering at a fairly steep angle. The other is to deal with torpedoes, normally from submarines, but also from surface ships that are coming in horizontally. So Missouri, around her waterline, had between 13 and 14 inch steel armor to deal with those large torpedoes. And that's actually this thick part shown here, a couple of uh, layers in. The idea was that the outer hull would cause the torpedo to explode 
and the armor belt would then gather those um, splinters and, and components of the torpedo that were coming in and prevent them from getting inside the hull, which is where they're protecting, of course, the engineering plant, the ability to maneuver, the ability to move. On the horizontal element, we have a similar structure. This armored deck, which you see the second deck here, is about nine to 10 inches thick steel. And then right below it is a splinter deck. Now this is a, uh, a reverse from the construction of the uh, torpedo uh, defense because here those shells could be uh, penetrating with much more momentum. They're much heavier than the torpedoes. And so we want to get that armor deck there first so that that causes the shell to explode and the splinter deck below then gathers those fragments that are going through, again, to protect the engineering component compartments, which are then another deck below. The idea of protecting the engineering components is that as long as you can keep maneuvering, you can at least get away. Uh, we'll talk how they defended against uh, the other vulnerabilities on a ship in just a minute. So we've got the armored deck and the armored belt around the waterline protecting the, the heart of the ship, the engineering component, which is also, of course, where you generate electricity necessary to move the weapon systems that are on board. There's another element, though, and that is the command and control structure. This on the right is actually the vault that is on the conning tower of the ship. In fact, you can, if you look closely, you can see the captain's back of his head right here. He's outside of the captain's chair. But in here is where, when under attack, the captain, the officer of the deck, the conning officer would retire. And as well, the helm and lee helm, the elements that control the direction and the speed of the ship, are inside that vault. And that vault is 17 to 18 inch thick steel, designed to withstand a direct hit. Now, to be honest, if there was a direct hit on the vault, the steering equipment, the directional equipment and stuff would survive. Likelihood is the guys inside would probably be overcome by the overpressure, but they could be easily replaced with other watch standards. Um, and so we have this to protect the command and control. And then on the left is one of the, uh, the armored deck hatches. So you can imagine these hatches, raising and lowering them is a major issue. It's hydraulic, it requires a lot of uh, engineering just to put in a hatch to go through that armored deck, but somehow you've got to get people and equipment up and down so you can't just make it solid. Um, these were the re did result in a, a handful of injuries as they closed or opened without control as there was various casualties on them um, because Missouri and the other ships were never attacked by uh, heavy weapons as we were built to defend against. Uh, these were actually uh, more a source of casualties than they were a protection as a result. So there are two-edged swords we start to build in these things. Uh, one of the other things that Missouri used uh, was a lot of redundancy. We had four screws, uh, four engineering plants independent to ensure not only high speed, but again, redundancy. So in the event of a loss of an engine or a, uh, a fire room, we could continue to steam. Missouri actually lost one engine while we were en route to um, Hawaii as the beginning of a round the world cruise. It's kind of an inauspicious start that one day out of LA, we, we actually lost an engine uh, due to a piece of uh, gear breaking off and traveling through the gearing. Um, it's a casually we train for a loud metallic noise in the engine, but not one that ever really happened until that uh, fateful evening. I was actually on watch as the engineering officer and when it happened, and I was calling up the, the rest of the plant when I heard the sound because it was so loud, but it was still a couple of, uh, couple of spaces away from me through a number of large, uh, thick bulkheads. It was that loud. And when they were reporting back to me that, hey, loud metallic noise, number one main engine, we shut it down, actually allowed that prop to pinwheel and we're actually fuel-wise more efficient <laughs> until we got the engine repaired and back up and running once we left uh, Australia. So we use redundancy. We use um, as well two rudders to ensure that we have the ability to maneuver even in the event of damage. Uh, the use of two rudders doesn't always necessarily mean that you're successful though. Uh, Bismarck had two rudders. Anyone know what happened to Bismarck? She took one torpedo in the tail that put one, her starboard rudder over at about 19 degrees she couldn't do anything but steam in circles, and so the British fleet just basically circled her outside of her gun range and put airplanes and fired shells in until she essentially took enough damage to sink. Uh, so the rudders are a very significant source of vulnerability. Um, and so Missouri has considerable amount of armor around the steering gear uh, on, on, the, um, on the rudders and also the ability to control the rudders uh, independent of the um, hydraulic engines that move them otherwise. Just to give you a sense of how big they are, you see the couple guys down there underneath the starboard rudder. Uh, these things are barn doors. Um, one of the things you do in maneuvering ships is you want to know their turning radius because as you maneuver them in company, you like them to maintain nice, neat lines. At least the admirals like it when you do that. And so you have to have what's called a turning diameter for every ship in the, in the formation. 
Missouri's turning diameter was the same as the turning diameter of a destroyer. Much smaller ship because we had these two barn doors and two shafts that drove the screws right over the barn door propeller or the rudders so that we could generate a lot of force on that rudder and kick the back end around pretty quickly. So this redundancy allowed us to ensure even in the event of damage we could continue and as well the high speed allowed us to get out of the way if we needed to and, and as well stay with the carrier battle group and the other ships that we were with. There we go. <coughs> I just put that one in because it's a pretty picture. Um, actually what it shows is a little bit more subtle. If you notice, I had trouble finding pictures of this so that's why I'm showing you this. There's a hose coming off the starboard uh, quarter here. This is actually leaving Missouri going to a small ship. She's being refueled from Missouri. Uh, this is important because in the Gulf War I, actually sorry, even before that when um, we were in the uh, American flag tanker, Kuwaiti flag tanker environment in the late 80s, uh, the Strait of Hormuz was the focus and there was oil tankers moving up and down through the Strait of Hormuz and the Iranians were threatening to blow up these tankers if we didn't go along with whatever it was they were interested in. Uh, and so Missouri could escort these tankers up there and provide fuel to the other escort ships with them without worry about being hit by the uh, Iranian silkworm missiles. Obviously other tankers were hesitant to go up there because those missiles could you know, really mess up their day. Um, whereas Missouri, if she were to be hit by one of those missiles, because of the armor, because of the structural steel that was put into her, uh, basically we'd be worried about a little bit of damage to the paint, and that's about it. So we could, with uh, some, level, some level of impudence, run right into the strait, refuel the small ships that were up there, and not be, um, not be concerned with damage. So that ability to uh, provide that kind of fuel was not planned for in the original design, but added later. But because her tanks were so large, she had the ability to steam literally around the world at 15 knots and still have half the fuel left. Um, and because she had uh, such armor, we could use her as a refueling platform in the event of you know, hostilities and so forth. Okay, so that's, that's a few things about Missouri that will tie back to the design principles we'll get to in just a minute. Now let me talk about some principles um, that are more associated with naval gunfire and missile fire, um, the concepts of accuracy and precision. These are not synonyms. You may have heard them used similarly, and some people do that, but they are not synonyms. Accuracy reflects the likelihood of hitting a target. Precision reflects the ability to hit the same spot repeatedly with a small um, amount of air, or a smaller amount of air. Uh, let me give you an example of this. Sorry, wrong direction. This is a series of photographs used when the Tomahawk weapon systems was first in production, first in design and development and getting approval from the Senate. And what you see here is the Tomahawk land attack missile in horizontal attack mode, quite successfully engaging a command and control bunker. You can see from the left to right, top to bottom, it hits the bunker quite successfully and very accurately. Uh, the problem is the missile was very precise, but in reality, and this will help you understand this, it wasn't as accurate as they hoped. If you'll notice, this part of the bunker is a different color. This was built weeks in advance of the target, or the... Uh, the um, test firing. This was added the week before when they realized, new, new to the missile that they were, that the missile's lowest altitude when it traveled was slightly higher than the building was. So although it was extraordinarily precise, until the target was enlarged, it wasn't very accurate. Um, and of course, if they put the video in front of the Senate with it flying right over the top, that wouldn't have been very helpful in terms of getting it funded. And so they added on the additional concrete to make it uh, capture, if you will, the missile. So the application there will show up as we talk about how we forecast, but the issue being we want to be sure that we are not so precise and so concerned about precision that we miss out on the accuracy component, okay? Uh, in other words, I'd rather be bigger and right than smaller and wrong, okay? And we'll talk about that, how that applies to facility design in a minute, okay? So that's some of the principles associated with this. Any questions so far? Are we you know, going too fast? Uh, this is stuff I lived for a couple, three years, so I sometimes have a tendency to talk about it too much or too quickly. Okay? No one's asleep yet. 
Come on, some of you guys got to knock off so you stay here for me. Um, all right, so how do, we, how do we apply these lessons to generating forecasts? First, we need to develop the tendency to think ahead. If you're in an operations role, much of your life is spent fighting fires. And you're thinking about just getting through the next day, killing the wolf closest to the door, draining the, the swamp to get to the alligators, that sort of thing. And, and getting out of that mindset and thinking ahead is difficult. And so the first and, and foremost is just the, the tendency or the, the challenge to just think ahead. Along those lines, as I mentioned in my discussion about accuracy and precision, it's better to be directionally correct than numerically so. What I mean by that is, if you think you're going to grow at 5 or 8%, let's go ahead and make it 5 to 8% rather than saying it'll be 4.5 or it'll be 6.5. Let's broaden it. Let's say let's be bigger and right than smaller and wrong. Okay, And we'll see again how that plays out when we start talking about design principles. Um, and that gets to the next step, which is understand the value of ranges versus point values, especially when we're talking about change. Change doesn't normally happen very uh, precisely and especially so when we're looking at it in the future. Uh, anybody in here have the gift of prophecy? Okay. Anybody have a great crystal ball they like to? No, of course not. If you did, you wouldn't be here. You'd be doing things in the stock market or whatever. But um, we want to make sure that we en encapsulate the future state in the range that we use rather than try to nail down precisely what we think it'll be. This is especially important when we're talking to senior executives about forecasts. Oftentimes, they'll want to, uh, if they're on the sales side, they want to sandbag because they don't want to be held accountable to meet those numbers. Um, if they're on the accounting side, they might want to you know, grow them faster because they want to show better growth to the street. Um, and so we want to be careful that we talk about ranges and understand where those numbers come from and who the, the individuals are providing them and what their motivations are. And then the discussion about step changes. Uh, Missouri represented in large measure a evolutionary growth from the older battleships. The Alabama was just a little bit shorter, had a little bit smaller guns, but otherwise was very similar. Um, you know, it was, was really a, 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 what we call a, a fractional growth, not a step change. Missouri of the 1980s was a step change. She now had tomahawk weapons, she had harpoon weapons, and she had uh, helicopters, which of course weren't even invented in World War II. Um, and as well, she's now providing fuel to other ships rather than just consuming fuel. So step changes that were, were significant in her useful employment um, in the 80s and 90s. And so similarly, in our businesses, as we look forward, we want to think about, well, what step changes have occurred in the past? What's the tendency of management maybe to look at M&A versus uh, organic growth? Uh, what competitors are there out there that maybe you know, 10 years from now we might consider buying, or five years from now we might consider buying? Not today, but what are some of those things that we want to perhaps give the ability to handle in our design, even if we don't need them right away, but we know that we can handle them. Now, of course, I'm sure in some of your minds you're thinking, well, doesn't that cost money? Well, sometimes it does, but sometimes it can cost very small amounts of money, as we'll look at in some of the practices that don't require major capital investment, but open the door or leave the door ajar for those changes in the future. Okay? And then uh, likelihoods and drivers. What are the things that are affecting your business? Are your customers moving to more of a direct store delivery or a DSDC where you've got to package it for the store but still ship it to their DC? How does that change the way your business behaves? Is management thinking about bringing e-commerce into your building or is it already there but it's starting to grow pretty rapidly? Think about those kind of drivers, those kind of things that are going to change your business most. Okay? Maybe they're not the biggest thing right now, but be thinking as you're thinking ahead to the future, what does this look like next year or five years from now? versus how it looks today, okay? So again, the objective here is just to be thinking more clearly. Maybe it's on the drive home, you stop thinking about the fire you were fighting, and you start thinking about what the next year looks like or the year ahead. Or maybe it's during a corporate retreat, if you have a strategy retreat, those are great times to sit down and talk about what are these kind of things that we're thinking about as you and the supply chain have to address and deal with those changes that the, uh, the senior executives are working through. Okay. So let's talk about some practices. How do, we, how do we do things that actually allow us to take advantage of these thought processes we're working on? How do we engage our design principles, whether it's a greenfield, brand new building, or even a retrofit? How do, we, how do we do things that cause us to be more prepared to address the future as we envision it 
and how do we do that without necessarily spending a ton of capital, okay? So let's talk about space. Space is the one thing in a facility that is the most fungible, that's the most useful in a variety of methods. Space is really what we're talking about when we build a facility. What we do inside of it, detail. How much space is needed? How big does the box need to be? <clears throat> and so we want to look for ways to be space conservative. We all know about V&A and narrow aisle, and the guys outside will help you buy a truck that'll fit into a six-foot aisle or a five-foot aisle and use that space most efficiently. That's great, and we can certainly use those tools. But in general, we want to think about how are we using space? How many of you have a receiving or shipping dock greater than 20 foot in depth? That is 20 foot back from the doors. Okay? How many of you have mezzanines over those receiving docks or shipping docks? Okay, a couple. That space, that space above those docks, is space you paid for when you built the building. Difficult to use unless you put some sort of floor over that dock, but it's space that's available. And quite frankly, with mezzanine space costing somewhere between 30 and 40 bucks a square foot, it's cheaper than it is to build it new, right? So we need to be thinking about how to be more space conservative as we look at a building overall. However, we are limited with the concern around building only what the investment warrants at the time. So you've got to build a business case for any new facility, right? Or you've got to build a business case for a retrofit. So we can't go out there and just say, well, I want to build 100,000 extra square feet just in case. But we want to make sure we have an idea around how I would add that 100,000 square foot on if the opportunity arises, if the need arises, either in expanding the facility laterally or building up in terms of adding mezzanine space, adding pick module space and that kind of thing. And that, that leads us to the escape routes or eventualities. How, how many remember in your defensive driving course, your, your, um, your driver's ed, you need to know how you're going to go if something happens in front of you, you've got to have a, a way out, a path out. Uh, I, just, I have teenage boys that just went through driver's ed and I've been emphasizing this as I want them to avoid accidents that already pay too much for insurance. Well, you need, in the same in your building, you need an escape route. You need to know where do I go when I run out of space? How do I maneuver? Is it a new building? Again, that's network stuff outside the scope of what we're talking about. How do I get more space in this building? That's what we're concerned about. And so we'll talk about some methods to do that. And then look at what your space consumers are, either now or in the future. You may have uh, a limited amount of value-added services right now because you're not doing e-commerce. But you add e-commerce, and now suddenly not only are you picking and packing, you've got to add the uh, catalogs, you've got to add the gift cards, you've got to add the gift wrap, um, and you need space for that. And so you need to identify what are some things that are going to consume space. We all know reserve storage is going to consume space, but we're all doing better at turning our inventory more rapidly, so that's going down, right? Yeah, no, um, obviously not. And as we start talking about things like nearshoring, maybe that's going to help relieve some of the inventory pressure and reduce your inventory turns as you can receive your inventory more rapidly than if it's sourced from overseas. But reality is inventory almost, almost always goes up, even when clients say, we're going to do better with our turns over the next four or five years. I have yet to find one that, that systematically does that, unless we actually build the building smaller. Because you know what Murphy says about warehouses, if you build it, they'll fill it. So we build it smaller, and we've done that. That's forced the supply chain to be more responsive and to drive the turns up, and therefore the space requirement down. So that is an option that we have available to us, but unfortunately most of us in this room don't have much control over the purchasing, don't have much control over the sourcing. And so unless you do and you're fortunate to do so, you kind of have to accept what's been delivered to you. And so we want to have the space to accept that, to be able to absorb that. Okay. Now, I've been talking for 25 minutes and nobody in here has said a word or asked a question. And none of you are asleep yet. So let me give you a chance, if you wish, are there questions or scenarios or concerns you have that are specific to your situation that you'd like some comments on? Or is it too early, too shy? Okay, that's all right, I can talk. Um, so let's talk about uh, facility design a little bit in more detail. Who's had an argument over single-sided versus double-sided buildings? <laughs> yeah. Um, 
I like, and I'll be honest, I have a, pre uh, a prejudice towards single-sided buildings. Why? Here's a single-sided building. I have two directions for expansion. You notice the left side of the building has office space, has some mezzanine, has some maintenance. That's kind of pinning that side. Offices tend to do that. So for instance, the sorter runs away from the office, so if I want to extend the sorter, I can do that. By having a dock only on the bottom side, I can expand upward without interrupting operations because that expansion work is all going on away from the dock. It doesn't affect my truck traffic, doesn't affect the shipping staging, doesn't affect the inbound traffic on, on the dock side. As well, I can expand to the right because now I'm free of the office, I'm running away from the office, and so I can move outward. And so normally I like single-sided buildings, and this is especially true because, frankly, when the building involves mostly pallet moves, which is where you oftentimes will see double-sided, our clients don't need a lot of help from us for that. They need help from us when it's more packaged goods, when it's more piece picking, when it's more automated, and those tend to be outbound conveyor products. And so because the conveyor can bring the product to either side, I just assume bring it to the same side as receiving. As well, single-sided buildings tend to be a little more space efficient when we talk about real estate on the outside. We only have to build one dock, and so that big pad of concrete is only showing up on one side of the building, and so I can save more of the real estate on the north side of this drawing, for instance, for expansion. If I do it double-sided, even if I build those docks up further, I still need that concrete space to absorb the truck traffic. And so I've spent more of my dirt on concrete than I have on building. And so again, I have a predilection towards single-sided. Doesn't mean double-sided are wrong or a bad choice for you at all times. It just means that in the circumstances I spend most of my time and with the real estate situations we've generally been dealing with, single-sided gives us more flexibility. Because as you can see, if you put a, a dock on the other side, in general that means you're left with only one direction for expansion. You can only really go to the right. It's okay, but it limits your options. Similar to a ship like Missouri being as big as she was, we could throw all kinds of things like weapon systems on her because she had room, because she had space. Here we can absorb change. We can absorb more reserve storage if we need to. And in fact, this design, if you notice, has a blue dotted line there on the right. This was designed for, I think, 2018, yep and then add on out to 23. So the client could save the cost of this initial build and therefore make it more acceptable to the board and so forth as far as the guys controlling the capital. If we only build out to the 18 line, then we can build out to 23, maybe in 17 or so. And then if, if need be, there was, you know, we ensured that if we're gonna put this on a piece of property, which we're doing right now actually, we jam this thing to the right and down and so we save as much of the dirt for expansion up and right. Okay. The other thing that building that expansion later does for us is once you've built it, you've committed to that space. You said, I'm gonna build this as this manner, I'm gonna use this in this way. What if this company, which actually is a manufacturer, decided they wanted to do some manufacturing by their DC as opposed to some of their facilities which are more on the eastern seaboard? Well, if we already built that as warehouse, yeah, we could turn it into manufacturing, but it's more difficult and it's not built purposefully for that. By not building it, if they said five years from now, yeah, we really wanna make some more manufacturing, we could take that space and use it for that so we haven't committed to that particular function. And so delaying capital spend, delaying building actually gives you more flexibility when it makes sense, when it, it, it's useful. We have one client where the, this line is the difference between building 40,000 and building 50,000 square feet holding off building 10,000 square feet doesn't save you enough capital in the remobilization costs, the extra wall, et cetera. It doesn't end, just save you, end up saving you much of anything. And so we wanna make sure that additional chunk is worth it. Here it's about 60,000 square feet, it's worth it. If it's you know, 10, 15,000 square feet, 20,000 square feet, it's probably not worth it. Go ahead and build it now. It's cheaper to build that first, that first square foot out to the full size than it is to come back and add that small chunk later. So does that make sense? I mean, I'm, I'm not talking about rocket science here. But there's some of the things that when you start thinking about how you use property, how you use a facility, it's helpful if you think, again, with that, that long-term view in mind, what's really known, what's not known, and what do I want to be able to adapt to and handle in the future, okay? This is also for the same building, and here, this is the end view of a pick module. Pick module, everyone, anyone not know what a pick module is? Who's brave enough to admit? They don't know what a pick module is. No one's brave enough to admit it. Some of you don't. That's okay. Um, this is a rack built structure, which means we have rack frames vertically. We have cart and flow rack on the, the lower level. 
shelving on the upper level, decking in between to provide a catwalk, and we have these pick conveyors, powered conveyor and gravity outriggers, a little bit of trash conveyor to take away the empty corrugate, and replenishment rack on the outer wings. But you'll notice this is only two levels high. As with mo most buildings being built today, the clear height's about 30 feet. And so there's room for a third level. And so what we've shown here is a deck on that third level. We call this dance flooring. So we can top those, those uprights off at 20 feet and lay decking across the top, and now we have space. The design out to 2023 only calls for these first two levels. And so that third level, which we're not putting any decking in yet, that third level is free right now. But if in the future, at some point, they decide they want to bring a packaging operation in, or they decide they want to add a whole new um, competitor, they want to buy somebody and bring them in here, we can add a whole new set of uh, pick media of whatever flavor. It can be shelving, it can be cart and flow, it can be a totally different configuration upstairs because it's just space. Um, the one cost we have here is we made the pick module slightly longer than we would have if we had tucked it all into three levels right at the outset. But lengthening a pick module is rather difficult. Adding a level to the top, pretty straightforward, pretty easy. And so this was a relatively inexpensive way to give them some flexibility. No necessarily known need for that space, um, but we're talking about maybe a delta of less than, than $20,000 to extend the length of the module and not build the top than going up. So the flexibility was well worth the minimal increase in investment. So this is a technique where we actually built a little more than we needed by not building the third level, but it gives them you know, considerable flexibility to do whatever they want up there. And if, if it's not picking, but like I say, packaging or some production, the space is available. Now I will say, because this facility is in the, the uh, south central part of the country, the fact that the building was already gonna be air conditioned is a factor. <laughs> if this is gonna be built in somewhere warm and you're not planning to air condition, that third level is a little dicey because that's uncomfortable. Um, and so you need to be thinking about those kind of elements as well. You want to take care of your people and not put them in some place that's, you know, going to be in the 95 to 100 degree range a significant part of the year. But again, since they're already air conditioning the building, that was not an issue for these guys. Okay? So we've talked about space, and again, space is the one thing that's truly fungible in a building. You can use it for anything. Um, but throughput's also an issue. And throughput is really the second half of the two questions that we ask when we design something. The two questions, of course, are how big and how fast. How big plays out in how much reserve space, how big a pick module, how big a shipping dock. How fast plays out in how fast does conveyor need to move, how many vehicles need to operate in the building, how many dock doors do we need. These things control how rapidly product can move through the building. And so second only to space, throughput is the next concern. And so let's talk about a few principles around ways we can handle future uh, flexibility in throughput. Okay. First of all, when we design for throughput, we need to be careful about designing the averages. Uh, who in here has more than the average number of legs? All of you should be raising your hands. The average number of legs is slightly less than two. So by definition, at least as far as I noticed, everyone in here has more than the average number of legs. So if I design to the average number of legs, nobody's going to be able to wear the pants I design, right? Because I'll be designed for 1.9 legs or 1.95 legs. And so we need to be certain that when we design for volume, we design for peaks, we understand how the distribution of behavior occurs throughout a year, throughout a quarter, throughout a month, throughout a day, so that we don't get caught designing for averages. If you're dealing with dot-com, you're probably pretty familiar with this. You get that bubble that happens sometime between 1 and 6 p.m. in the day of all those orders that are coming in that you want to get out that same day. You can't average it across all eight hours. You might have a two- or four-hour window where you're going to have most of your volume. And so we need to be sure that we're not looking at averages, but we're looking at, in general, 95th percentile. I'll give you some graphic uh, illustration of that here in a minute. However, we also want to be sure that um, Peaking isn't over-accentuated. By that I mean oftentimes uh, peaks in behavior are really more of a record-keeping issue than actual activity volume in a building. When we look at data, oftentimes we'll see that some days have really, really high activity levels, and it may be simply that those are the days those transactions were posted, especially as we've dealt with older systems. Now that we're moving into the more current generation WMS and, and ERP, we're not seeing that as much. 
but when posting was done manually, it was not unusual to see Fridays and Saturdays even be peak days, simply because those are the days they posted the week's business. Um, so you need to be sure that's really happening, but then also look at ways to mitigate that peak behavior. Are there some opportunities to maybe do a little bit of overtime to handle that, rather than building throughput to handle that peak, again, in order to limit the amount of capital you spend? And then as you look at forecasted levels of activity, you need to look at them in the context of technology thresholds. At what point am I really up against the edge of a particular technology's capacity? And what, how much headroom do I have in that particular technology? And I'll show you some pictures about that. And then finally, can we look at exception handling methods? Maybe, again, either overtime or a third shift on occasion, or a 3PL to handle some of the growth factors and, and increase our flexibility. Okay, so here is an example where we see quite a variation between peak and what I call 95th percentile activity. Peak, of course, are the tops of the red um, mountains in this overall mountain range. Blue is the 95th percentile. By 95th percentile, I mean that basically 5% of the days or somewhere around 10 to 12 days of the year, activity levels are above that blue line. What we find is that peaks above that blue line don't grow as rapidly in general, not always the case, in general don't grow as rapidly as averages in the 95th percentile does. So as we look out into the future, simply taking those peaks and growing them at the future growth rate is oftentimes inappropriate. As well, again, we oftentimes have these outlier behaviors in that 5 percentile that are above the 95th. And so we, either we want to make sure we understand what those days are about or look at ways, exception handling techniques or, or ways to mitigate the impact of those peaks. And again, you look at the green line, that's the average. So you see the danger, of course, in design of the averages. It's, not gonna, it's gonna give you a lot of days where you're really in trouble if that's a throughput um, that you're trying to handle through, for instance, a conveyor sortation system. So when we look at this kind of activity, this is historical, and we start looking into the future, we're gonna look at normally growing the 95th percentile rather than growing the peak and using that to determine what we expect our outbound requirement to be at that, um, at that time frame. Come on, there we go. As I mentioned, then we wanna look at what technology uh, thresholds exist so that as we determine requirements, we ensure we pick a technology that gives us some room to maneuver uh, in the future. Simple pusher technology for sortation has been around for decades. It's very effective, but it's only effective in the ranges of about 20 to 40 cartons a minute. So there's a, there's a level at which it's great. If your design requires you know, 12 to 14 at peak behavior at the design window out five years, this is a good choice. You've still got some headroom, pretty inexpensive, very reliable, um, but it gives you what you need. If on the other hand you're dealing with numbers that are higher, then you start looking at these sorts of technologies. Here we have a pop-up roller uh, transfer, and you can go out there and find various manufacturers that make these. Uh, narrow belt sorter, like that. And then on the right hand, of course, we've got a shoe sorter. And you see that those ranges overlap uh, in terms of the cartons per minute they can handle. So perhaps you're finding that, well, I'm at about 140, 140 cartons a minute at design year and peak. Okay, narrow belt sorter will handle it. Yeah, it will, but it ain't got a lot of headroom. Not a lot of catch up, not a lot of surge capacity. If your volume is faster or grows faster than you expect, which is a good problem, if marketing and sales do the job better than everyone expects, well, you might need a little bit more. And so you need to look at what sort of premium would I pay to buy this more expensive sorter, and true sorters are more expensive, but with the attendant increase in headroom. If on the other hand, your rates are in the 100 cartons a minute, no point in going up to this, the shoe sorter. That's way more money than you need because you still have 50% headroom left in the narrow bell sorter. So again, it's important that we think through what the technology limits are, whether it's sorters, ASRS tools, AGV tools, and where those thresholds are so we ensure that we stay well within the thresholds, but we have some room to maneuver again down the road, either an escape route if we need it. Questions here? Who's getting this? Okay. All right, so we talked about the reserve, the, the, the amount of space, the fungible space that we have. We talked about how we can handle variation in throughput, some techniques to do that. Pick faces is, is the final one, and um, it oftentimes gets overlooked because, it, and I see this a lot, clients will say, well, uh, you know, 100,000 square foot building can handle 9,000 SKUs. Really, okay? That's their business, that's their world, but is that really true? Is it, it, it may be true right now, but if we're gonna go from 9,000 to 10,000 SKUs, does that mean that we need a 10, 11% increase in space? Or does it mean more? It depends on the SKUs. 
uh, the, one of the reasons why we put that expansion in that design I showed you earlier is that client has some products. They're relatively new to the market. They're growing in that space. They're growing in the sales of that product. And it's a much bulkier product than the majority. They manufacture some incontinence things, and those tend to be bulky. And the other stuff they manufacture isn't. So we add 100 SKUs. It isn't the same as adding 100 of the other SKUs, which are small. It's 100 fairly big SKUs. And so pick faces become a real issue as we deal with uh, SKU proliferation. First of all, it will affect you. You may say, well, we manufacture the same 100 products we have you know, for the last 20 years. OK, well, it may affect you because your competitor has 200 SKUs and you're out of business 10 years from now. Um, but it will affect you. Uh, secondly, we talk about macro slotting. This is determining how many of a particular kind of pick face do you need, as opposed to micro slotting, where we determine what SKU goes in which pick face. Okay? And depending on which technologies we choose, they can either constrain or sustain growth. If we use good, flexible technology, we can ad adapt to a variety of SKUs, whereas if we use other technologies, we may not be able to. Um, because we're running out of time, I won't go through the whole real estate analogy, but if you want to talk about that later, we can. Uh, basically, it refers to the value of space in the building and how much uh, product warrants particular amounts of space. So let me just go to a couple of options here. Uh, this is a pick module design from plan view from overhead. It's actually the same one you saw the elevation view of earlier, so maybe that helps. And in here, we have three different types of pick uh, faces. We have pallet flow pick faces on the end here. Just a few of those, because those are pretty big, take up a lot of room. And if we have slow skews in there, it's a long way to walk past those skews when we're not picking them. We have carton flow in here, which is for faster product, but maybe not quite as fast as pallet flow. And then a number of shelving bays scattered throughout. So we can put our smaller, slower moving skews. And by slower moving, I mean by cubic velocity. Not necessarily by lines, but they don't need as much space. The nice thing about this approach is any one of these bays can be any one of these flavors. So as skews increase, we can convert from carton flow to shelving and go from maybe 20 skews in a bay to 120 skews in a bay of shelving. Or we can go from two skews of pallet flow to 20 skews of carton flow without changing the structure, just playing with a few of the pieces parts, a little erector set work. And so this gives us flexibility as the building grows and matures to adapt to either skew consolidation, because we have a couple of different you know, latex gloves that are both basically the same size, we can consolidate to one skew, or because everyone wants 14 different colors of those latex gloves, and so we can go from carton flow to shelving to adapt to that. But this kind of flexibility in design is relatively easy to do, doesn't cost a lot, doesn't really cost any more than normal pick modules, but it just takes a little bit of thought in terms of how we lay it out so that we can have this adaptability going forward.